invite Tony to come join me here. Um, so at OpenWay, we have these values that we've been living into, um, things like playful experimenting and queering power and clearing the way and slow trust building. Those are the four, so just a review for everybody. Uh, and I feel like this experiment we're doing in co-preaching, which this is, I think, our third or fourth time, um, I think it fits all of the above. I think it turns sermon writing into a playful collaboration, a chance to build trust and relationships. It exemplifies power sharing by doing things together and including multiple voices. And I think it just makes things more interesting for you all because we change voices every once in a while and you wake up a little bit, you know? <laughs> so it's been a really successful experiment and something that we really want to do more of, especially as I have fewer hours and Mark isn't co-pastoring with me. So if um, this is something you'd like to try, please let me know. Uh, everybody is welcome. And uh, it's just been a real joy to work with you this week, Tony. So uh, thanks for doing it with me. I'm going to give you the first word here. Hi, I'm Tony. Um, and this is my first time. So in preparing to talk about the passage today, I tried to use a bunch of the tools that we've been talking about over the course of the past, well, ever um, <laughs> since I've been here. So first I read the passage contextually, what comes before it, what comes after it, to see if that helps provide insight into what it's saying. And so um, we've been working through Matthew for a while. What I found is in Matthew 23 ends with Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem as he enters the city. And then by the time we get to Matthew 26, we're into the events of the Passion and Holy Week. But in between, in chapters 24 and 25, there's lots of discussion and stories and parables about signs of the end of the age, the coming kingdom, and what that might look like. And reading through the chapters, you might think initially, oh, the coming kingdom, this will be great and very uplifting. <laughs> but reading through the chapters, I felt like there was a lot of heaviness, right? There's references to weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then there's a series of parables, the parable of the 10 virgins, where five of the, five of the foolish ones didn't have enough oil for their lamps and got left out of the wedding feast. Then the parable of the bags of gold or talents, which some of us talked about in Church in the Small last week, where which ends with one of the servants being thrown outside into the darkness. Uh, and then the passage we're looking at today. And <laughs> I've been in church for a while, and I always kind of thought of this as a relatively straightforward good news passage about the importance of doing good to others and the social justice gospel. Great, we're finally on an optimistic uh, place. Uh, and then we get to the end, and there's one group going away to eternal punishment. So when I got to the end, I, I was like, kind of depressed, and I was wondering, why did I sign up for this? Um, but I pressed on. Um, one of the other things I noticed about these verses, uh, this verse in particular, but the wider swath of verses as well, is that they're often set up in binaries. So you have uh, the the wise and the foolish. You have you know the servants who multiplied the money and the servant who didn't. And then here you have the obvious binaries: sheep and goats, eternal life, eternal punishment, and also some more subtle ones. Are we saved by faith or works? Um, are we those helping or are we those being helped? And binaries generally make me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Not necessarily because they're wrong or bad but because they're so often simplistic or incomplete. And this is something I've learned a lot in my work. For those of you who don't know, I'm a lawyer. I'm trained as a lawyer. I work as a workplace investigator and adjudicator. And so in that work, I'm often called in. There's been a complaint filed. Somebody's alleging that someone has done something bad to them in the workplace. And I go in and I interview people and I look at the evidence and I make decisions about what happened or didn't happen. And sometimes I tell that to people and they're like, that's great. You get to find out who's lying and you get to find out who's right and who's wrong. And honestly, the, the longer I do it, the more I realize how there isn't ever a lot of black or a lot of white. There isn't a lot of lying and truth telling. There's an awful lot of gray. And, that's, and so it's in part that experience that makes me a little bit suspicious of binaries. And I think that in this passage, there are indications that Jesus also wants us to be careful about binaries. 
Thanks, Tony. Yeah, so Tony and I were noticing these binaries, and the first one we wanted to bring up is this age-old debate between faith and works. Um, some of you might have grown up hearing that language in church. Are we saved by what we believe, or are we saved by what we do? And traditionally, at least in Protestant churches, there's been an emphasis on faith alone or grace alone, that we can't earn our salvation through good deeds. And yet through this sermon series in Matthew, we've seen that Matthew seems to pretty heavily emphasize the importance of what we do, um, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, how we pray, how we fast, the wise and foolish builders. Um, in lots of the parables, we see this, including the one about forgiveness that I preached on last time. So when you look at this parable of the sheep and goats, some of the interpreters get a little nervous about this and they wanna keep the faith alone part. So they say, well, maybe when we talk about the least of these, that's the church, that's the Christians, the persecuted Christians, and they get in by faith. But then the rest of the world, the nations, are judged by how they treat the persecuted Christians. So that's their workaround. That may be the way that you see it, but whoever the sheep and the goats are, the king in the story never asks them what they believe, right? There are no theological tests that they have to pass. They don't have to have a check on whether they've prayed the sinner's prayer uh, to see who goes to eternal life or eternal punishment. So it wouldn't be a stress to say this passage is a bit about salvation through your deeds. And they're not extravagant deeds, right? They're not breaking people out of prison. We're visiting them, right? We're not uh, you know, solving world hunger. We're feeding hungry people. Jesus' yoke is easy, his burden is light. It's about these simple acts of love, how you treat people in need in a given situation, how you show mercy. And Tony mentioned binaries, and I think they can sometimes be clarifying. So here it's helpful to see where the priority is. Jesus is not prioritizing belief or how we muster faith in a particular theological proposition. His priority is on love as expressed in justice. He's more about orthopraxy, right practice, than about orthodoxy, right belief. And that's also where we tend to put our emphasis at Open Way. We, when people become members, we commit to shared practices instead of having to share all of our beliefs in common. But in some ways, this binary of faith and works breaks down. And that's what we're happening throughout this sermon is breaking down these binaries because what we believe is necessarily gonna influence how we act. So if I believe, like the fictional pastor in this first song that we sang today, uh, that true love hurts and that the person I've asked to grab coffee with is going to hell, this is going to influence how eager I'm going to be to really love them and see them or, you know, preach at them. Um, on the other hand, how we act shapes how we believe, right? Finding Jesus in our solidarity with wider humanity will influence what we believe about who God is. I find Matthew's reference to trees to be helpful. Earlier in chapter seven, he talks about how a good tree produces good fruit. So good deeds flow from a good heart, from good root beliefs. In other words, living faith is authenticated by the fruit of love. Love is our confession of belief. And in this sheep and goats parable, I think the core belief, the core faith item is that every person is made in the image of God and is deserving of care, whether or not we realize that Jesus is hiding inside them. That's a belief that produces good fruit. One more just little binary, mini binary I want to mention here is between justice and mercy. So in more progressive churches, we tend to focus more on justice, on addressing the root causes of harm and trying to make it so we don't have hungry or thirsty or imprisoned or sick people in the first place. But this is actually a parable that lifts up a different kind of work, addressing the effects of the harm. So the symptoms of the problem, symptoms who have faces and names, right? And we might call this mercy work. And I'm just going to throw the more conservative churches a bone here because I've been caricaturing them already today. But they're often better than progressive folks when it comes to mercy and tend to be more generous in donating money and volunteering to help people who are in need, the symptoms of the problem. So I think a combination of justice work and mercy work, which in our church we might call mutual aid or community care, that's needed. We need to break down the binary and do both kinds of things, but that's kind of the point of this whole thing is breaking down the binary. So Tony, why don't you bring up another binary for us? Yeah, I think the next binary we identified was what I was 
what I was flagging at the beginning, which was kind of the eternal life versus eternal punishment. So the last part of the passage, the goats will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life, felt heavy. <laughs> it seems also, it seems pretty cut and dry. That seems pretty black and white, mm -hmm. um, both aspects of it, both the eternal part and the punishment part. So again, I used a tool that I've just been introduced to, uh, the interlinear Bible, which helps you see what uh, Greek words are used in the original text and how they're translated. With a warning, I'm not, I don't know Greek. So, <laughs> you know, the translation is only as good as the tool, um, but it is useful because um, looking into it a little bit, it seems that there are two Greek words that can be used for punishment. And the first is colossus or col colison, and I apologize for my Greek pronunciation if that <laughs> offends anyone, um, which is the word used here, and tomoria, which is the other word. And there's a number of ways that the difference between these two words is expressed. Um, colossus is often used as punishment for the sake of the one who suffers, while tomoria is used as punishment for the sake of the one who inflicts it, more retributive punishment. Mm. Colossus is given so that the person may be corrected. Timoria is given so that authority may be vindicated. This sense of Colossus as corrective discipline is also seen through the original, its original use as a gardening term used in relation to pruning trees. And we've talked about trees and fruit and, and what uh, the purpose of that type of pruning is, which is interesting, but also a bit puzzling. Because in this passage, it's also tied, that word, punishment, is also tied to the word eternal. And does it make sense for corrective discipline to be eternal? Like, it, does it just go on forever? What's the, what, what's the correction for mm. if it's just going on forever? Um, which might also make us wonder about the, what the word for eternal means. <laughs> That's my cue. <laughs> so similar to what Tony said about the Greek word for punishment, there's also two words for eternal. And one of them is much clearer, and that word is adios. And that always means eternal. But the word used here is not adios, it's aeonios. And that's an adjective from the noun aeon, which is the word we get eon from. And aeon is much more tricky to translate. It seems to mean a long or indefinite or hidden amount of time. So aeonios can mean eternal, but in many places it actually refers to a time that has an end, a time that's temporary. So for example, in Romans 16, we read about the mystery that was kept secret for aeons, but is now disclosed. The word can't mean eternity there because the mystery isn't eternal because Paul says it's now been disclosed. So the translators chose to go with the phrase long ages instead of eternity. So when looking at this word that we find in this passage, lots of translators prefer to use the word an age or an age to come. So in other words, we could translate our sheep and goats passage by saying these ones will go to the pruning or the chastening of an age to come, but the righteous will go to the life of the age to come. So maybe we'll say, oh, good, the punishment's not eternal. Excellent. But doesn't that also mean on the flip side that the life is not eternal necessarily? For me, I just feel like we can trust God on the length and the contents of these ages to come. Some of you already know that I'm a not so closet universalist, that I happen to believe that over ages to come, everyone will become more fully aware of the love of their creator and will choose to receive that love. And I do believe that any fire, any punishment described in scripture is talking about a time of accountability and responsibility for the harms done. But it's the burning away of the chaff and the parts of us that aren't fit or ready for the community that God wants to make of us in the age to come. I think that the punishment of the age to come ends up leading to more people enjoying the life of the age to come. And to use another tree image, because that seems to be what's happening in this sermon, um, this time from the book of Revelation, I believe that the leaves of the tree of life will heal all of the nations. Now, you don't have to agree with me on this particular end times theology. Again, we don't lean on perfectly shared beliefs in this community for belonging. But I hope that you'd at least weigh these things carefully, because some of the alternative interpretations are the very things that cause people to reject God for his lack of justice. 
For example, Tony, in your legal role as adjudicator, I can't imagine that you would take a workplace offense committed in finite time and then decide to punish it with an everlasting vindictive torture. <laughs> I think that would probably be seen as unjust, possibly even as evil. So if you as a human being know how to make fair and even when possible restorative or transformative decisions that will lead to the kind of correction that's more like pruning for greater fruitfulness for the good of everyone, then I don't think it makes sense that the God who created you could not do the same. So again, eternal punishment, eternal life, things that seem very cut and dry, very black and white, but they suddenly have a little bit of nuance, a bit of room to breathe, some gray, maybe some possibilities to them. Do you have one more binary for us? <laughs> I do. It is the us versus them binary. <laughs> um, and so this is another potential binary, and it's a, a one that's less obvious on the face of the passage, but kind of one that might be brewing back here in the back of our brain. Um, it's about uh, one of the things that we've learned, and applying one more tool, one of the things that we've learned about parables is that characters aren't always who they think we think they are and we need to think carefully and critically about where we're positioning ourselves in the story so in reading this passage maybe you if you're like me are thinking yeah i know that in this passage i am not a goat for <laughs> sure excellent i'm a sheep at least aspirationally i'm a sheep i know the importance of being a sheep that's what i want to be I want to be the helper. I want to be the one giving aid. I want to care for the least of these. But in positioning myself, in positioning ourselves in that way, we're creating another separation, not just between the sheep and the goats, which is there on its face, but also between the sheep and the least of these. I'm a lawyer. Lawyers are super good at being self-sufficient and thinking, or at least, <laughs> wanting to show like we have things all under control. I'm a helper. I'm self-sufficient. I'm a provider of charity and mercy. I'm not the one who's dependent, who needs help, who needs to rely on others. That's not me. And, the, and in that way, the passage points to all types of ways that we might be tempted, even subconsciously, to separate ourselves from others so that we can feel good about serving them. But what does it do to our reading if we acknowledge that we're not always going to be the ones giving aid and we shouldn't be and that we may equally and equally powerfully be the ones who receive aid who will need to be fed and clothed and visited and cared for what happens when we identify with being more needy less self-sufficient and acknowledging that we need to rely on others what does it mean to humble ourselves enough to receive something from somebody else, even if we had initially thought that we were gonna be the givers. And I think that this reading of the passage is, is also consistent with something else we talked about over coffee, which is the element of surprise. <laughs> when the sheep and the goats are divided based on whether they had fed and clothed and cared for and visited the king, both groups are surprised. They're like, when did we do that, <laughs> right? But to stay, take it a step further, what does it do to our reading if we think about where the king is positioning themselves, identifying with the least of these? Whatever you did for these, you did it for me. We're the same. What does it do to our reading if we think of Jesus asking each of us to serve everyone else as though we were serving him because each of us bears his image? And in working through that reading of the passage, it really had echoes for me of some of the things we were talking about in the disability justice series. Uh, and uh, I was looking at a, a blog on the Disability and Faith Forum by Chantal Winnick, and she had this to say about the passage. She said, Jesus is effectively outlining a basic code of human rights that applies to all people, not just those who are marginalized. A kingdom vision is one without hunger, thirst, sickness, loneliness, or imprisonment. Rather than wasting time trying to determine who among us belongs into what category of the least of these, can we work together 
and with God towards that vision instead. And for me, this is the point of the passage where the binaries really start crumbling and where we start to see ourselves in multiple different places in the story. And even more when we realize that Jesus is everywhere in the story. There's no one box that can hold him. Jesus is the king. He's the one doing the separating. He's the one who's about to lay down his life. And also, Jesus is the least of these. <laughs> yeah, I remember when we were both having this realization over coffee when we were talking about the passage that Jesus is the most non-binary thing about this story. He kind of sets up all these binaries and then he breaks them himself. Um, he shows up as the storyteller, the one who's facing death, who's sharing his wisdom with his friends and with the ones who are about to arrest him. And then he shows up as the king in the story, the son of man, the one with the power to decide in the age to come. And then he shows up as the needy one, the body of the poor and the imprisoned and the sick. Richard Rohr says that there are two halves to life, that in the early growth part of our lives and faith, we need to build a container or build a box for simplicity, for clarity, for confidence, to distinguish between good and evil. But then there comes a time when Jesus kind of, when maybe the box starts to fail us <laughs> and Jesus has to help us break the box and get outside the box and open up a bigger world of non-dual wisdom and compassion. So to me, this parable is like a boxy, dualistic, maybe overly simplistic story with sheep and goats and faith and works and eternal life and eternal punishment and us and them. But if we have ears to hear, as Jesus says, we'll find Jesus all over the place, all over and through and outside of the boxes and the binaries. We find him outside the walls with the strangers, with the least, with the crucified. We find him inside the walls with the imprisoned, with the sick, with the power brokers holding the decisions. And then we find him just around the fire telling stories and inviting us to lean in and learn. And he says, you're going to be surprised where you find me. And you're going to be surprised where you find your friends and your neighbors and your enemies. And you'll be surprised where you find yourself. But in the meantime, it's simple. Follow me. I'm walking the way of love through death into life. And that's what we came up with this week. Thanks, everybody. We'll give you just a minute to reflect on that and to think about where that hits you in your own life and where you resonate. And then we'll pray together. Let's start. 